Amen. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, church. Good to see everyone this morning. We are grateful that you are with us. It is so good to see. Folks are still coming in slowly as we get more comfortable. I understand that. If you still need to wear a mask or feel like you need to, that's fine. You just wear that mask. That's all right. If you don't, if you want to go maskless, that's that's the only thing we'll let you do less here is mask less. Okay, nothing else other than that. <laughs> don't look at it like that. It's all right. But uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. There was a man one time that had gone for a swim. He had cooled off from the day. He'd gone into his house. He'd taken a shower. He felt very comfortable. His body temperature felt at ease. He was sitting on his front porch enjoying the breeze of the afternoon when he saw out in front of his house two people pushing a car up slight hill. And he realized that if they were going to get up the hill and over it, that they needed help. And so he thought within himself, now I sure am comfortable, and I sure am cool, and I've been cool for most of the day. Do I really want to get out there and get sweaty and grimy with all of them, and, and, or do I need to just stay here on the front porch? And so a little battle, as it does with most of us, fights within. And then he realizes, and so he jumps down off the porch, and he goes and he helps push the car up the hill and then over a little bit. And it is at that time that man looked at him and said, thank you for your help. You are just what we needed for that little extra just to get over that hill. In the church, it's the same way. In the church, we all need each other. Whether we realize it or not, or whether we think about it or not, our fellowship, one with another, is important. And the idea that we are family family that struggles together, a family that sees its, its problems, its cracks, its weaknesses, but also sees its strengths, also sees the importance of being together, it sees the importance of worshiping together, struggling together, and being together, united in a cause, united in a belief of a common faith that has one goal, that of heaven. And as we do that this morning, that's what we want to look at. Paul writes this wonderful book of Ephesians. He writes it to the church at Ephesus. And he writes a, a most beautiful, beautiful book. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians are very theological. That's usually Paul's modus, uh, modus operandi, if you will, his way of operating. In his books, he has a very theological section and a very practical section. And usually it's half except for the book of Romans. Romans spends 11 chapters dealing with very deep theological things, and then the 12th chapter begins the practical. But in the book of Ephesians, you can almost divide it in the middle. First three chapters as we have them divided. Very theological. As he talks about Christ, and he talks about the church. But then beginning in the fourth chapter, he begins a very practical section. It is therein, beginning, if you will, in verse 11, that Paul makes some interesting statements that I want us to key on this morning. As we think about this idea of the church not being apart, not being separated, but we for a long time have worshipped in our homes. For many weeks we sat listening to our phones, listening to me go on and on through the phones, the wonderful message of God's Word. Now, as we beginning to see things change and lift and see a change, if you will, in attitude, and a change in our abilities to get out, we need to realize it's time to come back together. It's time to be church that focuses upon one another, a church that sees the value of one another. 
And I'm not saying that we haven't throughout this pandemic, and I'm not saying that we won't uh, from here on, and that you haven't through the years before I was ever here. It's just to remind us of our responsibility and our role. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says in verse 11 that he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, four. Now let's just stop right there. The word four is the very next verse, verse 12. But when you stop and think about what Paul says to the church at Ephesus, he says, you got some talents, you got some abilities. And then he says, four. Four what? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. The fact that we all have talents and abilities is that which God has blessed us with. We all have abilities. We all have talents. Now, they may be different. When you stop and look at the the story that we highlighted last week, the parable of the talents, Matthew 25. Five, two, and one were given, but each one was given according to his ability to manage. But you look in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, Paul talks about the spiritual gifts there, the gifts of prophecy, the gifts of interpretation, the gifts of speaking in tongues. Each one was different. And not every individual had the same gift. While those things are passed away, those things are no longer, it still gives us an understanding of what? Well, we're all different, but we all have abilities. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, he gave some apostles, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. What's he saying? Well, without getting into all the different ministries there, he's saying, look, you got abilities. you got talents. Now to think about what he told the church at Rome. He being Paul told the church at Rome in Romans 12. Beginning in verse 6, he begins a list there of abilities. The ability to exhort, the ability to prophesy, the, the ability to, to give. Or just some of the things that he talked about there. But he begins that whole list by saying this. He says, having gifts, therefore differing, use them. The New King James says, let us use them. In other words, here's the point. The point is, we all have abilities. What you can do, maybe I can't do, and what I can do, maybe you can do. What might it be? Maybe you're very good at making phone calls to folks. Maybe you're very good at sending cards. Maybe you're very good at making pies and taking to folks that need just a little pick-me-up. Maybe you're you're very good at, at baking bread and you just want to help folks along the way. Maybe you're very good at driving people places. Maybe you're very good at listening and you can simply sit and listen to people as they tell their issues and their problems and their heartaches and their hurts. Each one of us has to, has to analyze what we can do. Each one of us has to stop and think about what what are my strengths? And some would say, preacher, I don't have any strengths. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. What do you like to do? Where's your heart? Where's your passion? In other words, if you sit down at home and you think, here's what I'd like to do. What is it? Well, preacher, it's read a book. Great. Do you know somebody else that likes to read books? Have you shared your book with them or the, I, here's what I'm reading? Well, preacher, it's sit and watch TV. Good. Go find somebody who wants you to watch TV with or talk to them about what you saw on TV the night before. Whatever it is, whatever you have a passion for, use that talent. Use that ability. Be reminded that, that Paul says he gave each one different. No one was more important. No one was, was more needful. No one was lacking in what they had and what they didn't have. He says, whatever you have, he says, you use that talent. Let me give you an illustration that illustrates the point. Stories told of a bricklayer that had a brother and his brother was a famous violinist. He was laying brick one day, and a lady came up and was watching him and admiring his work. But she couldn't help but think about, there he was, a poor laborer with a very well-off 
famous brother. And so she looked at him and she said, it must be nice to have a famous brother. And he said, oh, yes, yes, it is. And then she realized that maybe she was diminishing his talents to lay brick as opposed to his brother's talents of being a violinist. And so she said, but you know, we've all got different talents and it's all important. And the bricklayer said, yes, I know. Said, you take my brother, for instance. Said, if he couldn't make money playing that violin, how would he ever get a house brick? But I can brick his house for him. There's the point. The point is, we all are different. Paul didn't say, okay, you're more important than this one, and you're more valuable than this one, because you can preach, or because you can teach, or because you can lead prayer, you're more valuable. It's not to say those aren't valuable, but it's not to say that you're less valuable. Share your talents. Share your talents with one another. But then go back. Go back to to Ephesians chapter 4. What does Paul say? He says, well, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for... Now, we got that far, didn't we? For what? Well, the first thing he says, the equipping of the saints. You ever wondered exactly what Paul's talking about there? Equipping, we think of, well, you know, that's where they give you all the stuff that you need. I remember in junior high trying to play football, trying being the operative word. I was 110 pounds if I was wet. And I was as slow as molasses. But I remember the first day. Darty, come in here. You go into a little cage. Here's your helmet. Here's your shoulder pads. Here's your knee pads. Here's your thigh pads. Here, here's your hip pads. Here's your pants. Here's your practice shirt. Go to it. Got it. We think of that being equipping, and to a degree it is. The word itself, used only a couple of times in the New Testament, has the idea of making complete. So here's what Paul says. Paul says, use your talents to do what? Well, first of all, to make complete other brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just equipping the saints, but serving one another. He says, use your talents to serve one another. That's what God expects of us, right? Remember what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7? By love, serve one another. By love, we are to serve one another. What a strong statement that is. It's not one of those statements that we always like because, you see, that that implies, oh, I have to do something. Let's understand. Let's let's put a a pin in this thought. We're not going to dwell on it, but I want to put a pin in this thought. Coming to worship is not all that is entailed within Christianity. Think about that for a minute. Hold on to that. In a few weeks, we're going to talk about the importance of worship. <laughs> but nevertheless, there's the thought. But as Christians, we need to ask ourselves, what can I do for my brother and sister in Christ? How can I help them? Because you see, as we're going to see in just a minute, the Bible uses several one another passages. Well, what's the one another? It's one to the other. And so when Paul said, serve one another, he says, don't just receive, but give. Don't just take it in, but give. See what you can do for others. Use your talents not only to equip, not only to serve, but also, Paul says, to edify one another. Boy, that's important. Edifying is the idea of encouraging. It's the idea of building up one another. Building up one another is important. It's the idea of encouraging or lifting the spirits, but not just lifting the spirits. You see, sometimes we think, well, encouragement is the idea of lifting people's spirits that are down. That's part of it. But encouraging is also the idea of helping those that are struggling and yet maybe don't even realize they're struggling. You might say, 
What are you trying to say? Is there a Christian that is not struggling? Is there a Christian that's not struggling with something? And sometimes we don't even realize it. We all struggle. We all have our struggles. We all have our burdens. And as much as we all have our burdens, whatever they may be, it's up to us to encourage. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 11, he reminds us to edify one another. And the Hebrew writer that we studied not long ago, Hebrews 3 verse 13, says exhort one another. So you see, there's that idea. You, you build up. You encourage one another. So Paul says, go back to the text, Paul says that you use your gifts for the edifying of saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's your purpose. That's what you've been called to do. That's what God asks of us. And so as a church, that's what we need to do. We need to sharpen each other. Isn't that important? Isn't that what Solomon said in Proverbs 27, verse 17, that iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens another? Now think about this idea for a minute. If it is our responsibility to equip, to serve, and to edify, and it's all of our responsibility, it's not just the preachers, it's not just the elders, it's every one of us's responsibility, then we have to remember that we have a purpose. We have a reason. But the Hebrew writer reminds us in Hebrews chapter 10, that while we're to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, that we are individuals, that he goes on to say, if you look down in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, or verse 24, he says, let us consider one another, provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Now, folks, let's think about that for a minute. Hebrews 10 verse 25 says, don't abandon the worship assembly. And there's a difference between when you can't come because you're sick or because of the pandemic, but when you abandon the assembly. Now, we look at verse 25 and we say, oh, it says come to church. That's right. But do you remember why it says come to church? Go back to verse 24. Let's consider one another to provoke, to love, and to good works. How do we equip? How do we serve? How do we minister? We help others. One way, come to worship. That's not the only way. Use your talents, not just on Sunday, but use them the other six days of the week as well. And so the church moves forward. How? Well, it moves forward by understanding, sharing its talents, shaping or sharpening each other, and then by stabilizing each other. If you're there in Ephesians chapter 4, look look in verse 14. That we should be no longer children tossed to and fro, but carried about by every wind of doctrine, slight of men of cunning craftiness, by where it will by they lie in wait to deceive. Paul says, you see, we do all this so that we can be faithful children of God. We do all this to stabilize. We do all this so that we won't be carried about by by the various teachings. You see, we all have a common enemy but a common goal, right? Sure. Our common enemy is Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says to watch. Why? Because our adversary, the lion, walks about seeking whom he may destroy. He stalks is the idea. That old Satan, it's interesting. The word used there goes back to the idea of a hyena. Hyena is one of the most vicious animals that walks. Yet, Peter says, be careful. Because he walks about as a roaring lion. He walks about. As a hyena, he stalks his prey, seeking whom he may devour. Peter was told in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, Satan has desired you 
that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. Look, if, if Satan was after Peter, if Satan was after Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, he'll be after us, right? That's our common enemy. That's our common foe. Our common goal, however, is heaven. And our common obstacle is Satan getting in the way of us getting to heaven. You see, while he tries what he can and tries what he may, we realize the Bible teaches us that we're to withstand temptation, that we're to, to, to stand against Satan and his ploy. That we're to put on the whole armor of God, and in putting on the whole armor of God, that we stand true and steadfast. But now within the context of Ephesians 4, Paul says we need to not just stabilize ourselves, but stabilize each other. If we've got a common enemy but a common goal, and that goal is heaven, and we want to get there, then we need to help each other to be sure that we get there. That's the challenge. How do we do that? How do we accomplish that? Well, we remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2. And what he also wrote again in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says that we're of the house of God or the household. What does that mean? He says we're family. You and I are family. And when we came, when Suzanne and I came back March 22nd, 2020. How do you remember when I started? Just remember, that's when quarantine set in. First Sunday, boom. Paul Darty and Suzanne Darty were the plague to River Road. <laughs> Couldn't have timed it any better. When that set in, as a nation, we all went our separate ways. And in many ways, we were fighting against Satan by ourselves. But we need to help each other. We need to help each other. With the common enemy being Satan, the common goal being heaven. We need to push forward. We need to realize that as individuals, we need to be the eyes that are watching folks to see, you know, what people need. And we need to be the ears that are listening to what people are saying that we need to be the mouth that sometimes will tell them to straighten them out, or maybe even the smile that will encourage them. I had a preaching buddy this week that gave me an interesting thought. He said, sometimes when you come to church, folks are just looking for you. He says, they don't necessarily have to talk to you. They just want to see your head or see your face. And the impact that you make upon them. And he wasn't talking really to preachers. He said he used this in the congregation where he was preaching. He said that can help them get through the week. Well, that's an interesting thought. As Christians, we stabilize one another. How important is that? Well, think about these one another passages. Think about, go back and use your concordance if you want to look at exactly in the, the text. But think about, in the New Testament, you have the idea of being kind one to another, forgive one another, forbear one another. The idea of love one another, serve one another, use hospitality one towards another, edify one another. Preacher, all those there? Yep, and there's a few more. These are things that the body, the family, are engaged in as we stabilize one another. Why? Because... Guess what? I don't want to walk into heaven by myself. I love my wife. I love my, my son. I love my daughter-in-law. I love my grandchild. I love her side of the family. I love my mama and daddy. They carried me to church every Sunday. My father that serves as an elder congregation. I love my sister, my brother-in-law, my two nieces, my two nephews-in-law, if you want to call them that. My two, whatever you go beyond, the nieces have children, those things, you know. I love them. I want them to go to heaven, and I think they're on their way. I really do. Because they have been faithful, 
Some of them have already passed, but they were faithful children of God, and they are faithful children of God. And I want you to go to I don't want to walk into heaven, and I don't want to spend eternity with just a few of my physical family members. And so whatever I can do to help you, and let me tell you, whatever you can do to help me, I'm going to let you know. Because heaven is our goal. Heaven is our aim. And so Paul would write, go back to Ephesians chapter 4, go to verse 16. For whom the whole body, joined together by which every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every what part does its share. Every joint supplies. Don't just leave it to the elders. Don't just leave it to the song leaders. Don't just leave it to the deacons. Don't just leave it to the preacher. Every joint. Every joint does what? Every joint supports each other. A body that works well. A body that is physically fit, physically able, that is working well has all of its parts. Doctors tell us there are ten different systems, you know, the circulatory, the digestive, and all those different systems. That Each one of those systems working well together makes for a whole, good, complete, physical body. Each one of us working together. You see, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, that he says that when I come, there be no schisms or divisions among you. The word is schisms or schisms, depending on how you pronounce it. And I've been told that I pronounce it wrong, but I looked at Webster and it said you can pronounce it either way. So there you go. The word itself has the idea of internal division. Paul says don't let the church be divided. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You heard that verse before? Well, just look up just earlier above our text in Ephesians chapter 4. That's what Paul said. Paul says, learn that as each joint supplies, as the body is fitly framed together. That's in Ephesians chapter 2 as well, verse 21. Let each one supply. Let each one support. Let each one help. Let each one build. Each one is important. Each one is valuable. Stories told of a congregation that, that built a, a beautiful new building. Oh, it was beautiful. It came the day to have open house, and this congregation was going to have open house on Saturday, and then Sunday they was going to have worship. And so on Saturday they had open house, and they had you know they had things to do, and they had had uh, refreshments, and they had everybody walking through the building. Oh, everybody was just amazed and in awe of how beautiful it was. Saturday night, storm came through. Some of the shingles blew off, and the rain got in that new beautiful auditorium, and some of the walls were ruined. Why? Because a few nails, not all of them, but a few nails didn't hold the shingles down. In the church, we need to be mindful of that, that we need to support each other. Each one is valuable. You're valuable to me. I'm valuable to you. When I come up missing, I'm sure you're going to ask, why is Jay preaching? Probably some of you are going to say, hallelujah, he's not here talking about me. When you're not here, I'm going to call. I'm going to see what I can do. Why? That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. That his family were to do. Why do we do all of this? What does verse 13 say? In the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, Paul says we do all this so that we can conform to the very image of Christ. 
so that we can be like Christ. Isn't that our goal? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? According to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, aren't we supposed to be like Christ? Yes. And Paul says we do all this. We do all this sharpening. We do all this sharing. We do all this supporting. Why? So that we can help each other be in the very image of Christ. So that we can all hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So that we can all walk hand in hand home together with God. I'm looking forward to heaven. I know if you ask me, I, I'm not, you know, if, if the Lord calls me home today, that's so be it. I'm not really that anxious to go today. I would like to see my granddaughter grow up a little bit, you know. I'd like to take care of my wife in her old age. Y'all are laughing. She, she's younger than I am, so it's all right. But yet, I believe I'm ready to go. And I want to help you go as well. And I hope you will help me to go. This morning, if you're not a New Testament child of God, or you're one that needs to put your Lord and Savior on in baptism for the remission of your sins, or you need the prayers of the church, whatever the case, why don't you come? All together we stand and sing. There's